Hello, my name is Alan Bagnall. I'm an interventional cardiologist, and today we're going to be doing a case of uh, right coronary artery angioplasty. Our patient is a 40-year-old female, and we're going to do this from the right radial artery. I'm going to select our inventory to begin with. I've chosen a six French right radial sheath, and we need a guide wire to navigate our way through the peripheral vasculature. I'm going to choose a standard 035 guide wire, and I generally use one that has a J curve at the end for maximum safety. Next, I'm going to choose our guide catheter, and for this case, um, I'm going to choose a 6 French guide catheter with a Judkins right 4 shape. So now we have what we need. We can move to uh, our coronary angiogram. I'm going to place auto track on our J curve wire here so that we can follow it in. I've already put in my guide catheter and I have my wire ready. So here's our sheath in the forearm and I'm just going to advance in my J-tipped wire which you'll see emerging from the sheath now. So this is us navigating up through the radial artery approaching the brachial artery, and that went very smoothly through um, the elbow there. That can commonly be a place where you might find yourself entering some small branches, which requires you just to um, redirect your wire, or sometimes even to take an angiogram so that you can understand what the anatomy is there. So continuing up the brachial artery now, I've got a good amount of wire in here. I'm just going to advance my um, guide catheter over the tip of the wire, you can see that I'm fixing my, um, my guide wire and I'm slowly advancing my catheter, but I'm not going to let the tip of the catheter go past the end of the guide wire. Next we need to come around the subclavian artery, and again I'm just sort of using the visual clues that I've got here to make sure that it all looks like it's following the predicted anatomy. Following with my guide catheter again, and now advancing down towards the ascending aorta. Now, in this case, that's all progressed very smoothly. Sometimes when you come around the arch, you find that your wire goes down towards the descending aorta. And in those cases, either using your guide catheter to redirect your wire or asking the patient to take a deep breath in can help in finding the ascending aorta. As I advance my 035 wire, you'll see it comes and abuts on the aortic valve. If I just do that again, we come back and down, and that's it curling up on the aortic valve. So the wire is then fixed again, and I'm advancing my um, guide catheter down into the root of the aorta. Now at this point, my 035 wire is no longer required. I've got my guide catheter safely to nearby the right coronary ostium. So we're just going to remove this now. that here. Now we need to move our table and our C-arm into a position. Now getting into the right coronary artery, um, you generally need to have your uh, C-arm in an LAO position and that allows us to see the origin of it against the aorta. If you stay in AP, it's much more difficult because the right coronary artery typically comes out straight out of the screen at you in that view and you can't differentiate it from the aorta. So let's come into our 30 degrees LAO. I'm maybe just going to, actually going to go a bit steeper on this one, maybe 40 degrees LAO. So we may need to do some adjustments to the table, so I'm just going to screen a little bit here. Okay. Now, in this view, our right coronary artery ostium lies towards the left of the screen. And I'm going to use, I'm just going to torque the catheter around towards the right coronary artery. I'm looking for it just to sort of drop into to place. And there it goes, just dropped in there. Immediately I'm checking the pressure. I'm looking my, um, on the screen here, we can see that the lower tracing in red here is showing me my, my pressure that's being measured at the tip of the catheter. 
that looks like a normal tracing, not damped. And so that tells me I'm okay to uh, take a test shot, make sure I'm in. Not quite. You can see we're able to just see the artery, but the catheter is just sitting above it. So what I'm going to do is just bring it back a little bit, torque it, push it down, and just see if that's dropped in. No, not quite there yet. Still just not sitting quite as I'd like. There, that looked like it dropped in. Now, interesting thing that we saw there, the tip of the catheter, just as I took the injection, just dived into the conus branch. And a clue that that's happening can be that your pressure tracing damps off. So if you see that happening, you shouldn't inject at that point. An injection selectively into the conus branch can precipitate ventricular arrhythmias. So I'm looking at my pressure tracing now. That looks fine. So I'm just going to see if I can just see my catheter tip is just still selecting that conus branch a little. So I'm just going to torque it around a bit. Just small movements. And that's looking a lot better now. So let's take an angiogram in that view. What I'm going to do first is just mag up one size and just change our table position a little bit. Just to center up on the screen. Now, we'll take our cine here. And you can see a roadmap appears on the left of the screen here. So we can see from the picture we've taken so far that in the sort of mid-right coronary artery, we have got a severe area of stenosis. And that's our target for treatment for today. Now, we can also take some additional views of this. Um, and you take additional views really just to help you get an understanding of the length of the lesion, the relationship of any branches to the lesion, to judge whereabouts you're going to land your stent. So let's have a look at some uh, other views of this. So first off, we're going to come into the uh, REO position. I'm going to give this about 30 degrees REO. And just check our table position again. So we just need to move across a little. All right. There we go. Now, in this in this uh, view, we should see the right coronary artery coming straight down the screen. We'll just take a picture here again. So very useful for looking at the mid-right coronary artery. Not so helpful for looking at the uh, distal branches of the right, um, which in, in this view are kind of, kind of turning back on themselves. And we can take one further view. We can try an iliocranial view. The number of views you take is really down to um, what the number that you need in order to understand the anatomy. No more, no less. Check our table position again. And we'll take another cine here. Okay. Now, if I can take a moment here, we'll look at the effects of different angulations of our, uh, of our different C-arm angulations on the radiation that both you as the operator and the patient becomes exposed to. So I'm just going to click on our radiation module here. So what we see on the screen here is first off an image of a patient and the dose that they've been exposed to in milligrays. And on the right of the screen we see the scatter around the patient um, that, the, that both you and the team in the cath lab are exposed to. And it's important to minimize our radiation exposure as much as possible for both the patient and the operating team. Now on the picture on the right, things that are in red show areas of high radiation, progressing towards green, areas of lowest radiation. And you'll see that there are circles around the patient that represent that scatter. 
Now, the interesting thing is, is that there's not a linear decrease in radiation exposure the further you go away from the patient. In fact, it works by an inverse square law. So if you double your distance away from the patient, then the radiation dose that you're exposed to goes down fourfold. So being close to the patient and close to the scatter is a bad idea, but just moving a little bit further back can really substantially decrease your radiation exposure. Now, we can show where our beam is at the moment on the patient. This is in our iliocranial view. Now, if I start screening in this view, you'll see the color change on the patient's skin. And when I'm using the fluoroscopy, I'm going to start screening now, you'll see that skin change, the dose change, happens very slowly. Barely any difference at all. Just begin to warm up. On the other hand, if I'm using Cine to capture images, we see a very different picture. So I'm doing this just for demonstration purposes. But here's the effect, and if you watch in the picture in the middle of the screen, what happens when I keep my foot on the pedal during a Cine. You can see the dose building up. It's becoming redder and redder on the patient's skin as the dose increases. All right. So you need to use that Cine pedal conservatively. The quality of fluoroscopy on most modern systems now is very, very good. You rarely need to do it other than for documentation purposes and generally try and keep those as short as possible. It's possible to use fluoro store and capture things like balloon positions, stent positions, balloon inflations and all of those with entirely adequate quality. So really try and limit your use of, of, those, um, uh, of the Cine pedal if you can. So, for this case, we'll come back now to our um, uh, patient, and we're going to come back into the LAO position, and we're going to then select our guide, our guide wires for doing the, uh, the PCI. So uh, we need to just put this in back into our LAO um, 40 position. And we get rid of the cranial tilt that we had before. We'll just get our table back into the optimum position. Okay, so we have our guide catheter in. We need to select ourselves a guide wire. So if I come across to the inventory now, and we're going to be choosing an 014 inch standard guide wire. Our artery is not particularly tortuous that we need to get to, so I'm not expecting to need anything hydrophilic. We are able to choose the tip that we put on to this. I'm going to choose a 45 degree bend on the end of my wire. And I'm just going to put auto track on this so that um, we can follow the wire as it comes round. So let's start doing that. Let's get our guide wire. Now for these simulator cases we need to use a 300 centimeter wire which gets a little bit difficult because we're a bit restricted on space here. So we're just popping that through our catch and advancing the wire. We'll see as you use the simulator that the point where it recognizes the wire on the left-hand side of the screen, we should see it light up. There we go, that's it lit up. And if I just come round to things, here's our wire just inside our catheter tip. Now I'm just going to take this down and then take the auto track off because that's going to get a little bit uh, annoying otherwise. So we just do that on here and we'll just keep it on the guide catheter. Right. So I've got a talking device here to help me steer the guide wire down the artery. These talking devices, they're just a simple screw closure to tighten them up and similarly to loosen them off. So I'll just tighten that onto the wire. And we're going to slowly advance our guide wire into the coronary artery. And we can use small puffs of contrast if we see our guide wire deviating 
from our roadmap. So I'm just going to see where we are here. So that's us just about to come to the lesion. And again, I'm just steering the guide wire gently across the lesion. I have a visual reference map so that I can see. Here we can see that the guide wire looks like it's going off into a small side branch. I'm just going to pull back, redirect, advance slowly again, found the same branch. Let's try redirecting again. And that time it's gone round into the distal right coronary artery. So just as you're doing the case, just keep your mind aware of where all the different branches are and um, don't keep advancing your wire if it doesn't look like it's going in the right direction. So I'm just going to advance this into the distal right coronary artery. There we go. So at this point, we just slip our talker off and we need to select a balloon. So we can... Two options that we have are either balloon angioplasty to begin with, followed by stenting or direct stenting. In this case, I'm going to choose to um, dilate the narrowing with a balloon first. So I'll just pop this on the wire and then we'll select from our inventory to tell the computer what balloon we've used here. So you need to be able to keep your wire position fixed as you do this. And usually you'll have someone, the uh, second operator, who will assist you during this, air, this um, part of the case. But you can do it by yourself. So you just fix your wire, advance the wire, advance the balloon, sorry, to a point where you're past the, over the, the um, rapid exchange port and then the balloon can move on over that. So let's select our balloon. So we've got um, balloon dilatation catheter. I'm just going to take a 25 by 15 balloon here and choose something that looks like it'll be long enough to cover it, not excessively covering the device, because pretty much anywhere that you've ballooned, you want to be covering by stent. So here's our balloon that we've chosen. We've got a nominal pressure of six atmospheres. We've got a rated burst pressure of 14 atmospheres, so that's saying we don't want to go above that pressure. Let's select that. And we're just going to advance our balloon on the wire until on the simulator we see it light up to say that it's recognized it. There we go. So if we screen again now, as you can see, my guide wire hasn't moved. So we've been successful at controlling our guide wire. It's very important that, that you achieve that when you're uh, doing a case, because if the wire slips on, particularly if it goes out into small distal branches, you have a risk of perforation. So the balloon has got radio opaque markers at the proximal and distal edges. And I'm going to just advance that down to a place where I think it's about across the lesion. I can then check that balloon position with a small puff of contrast. Just need to go in a little bit further. Let's check again. So we've now got our balloon straddling the lesion. So remembering our burst pressures, we can now inflate our balloon. A thing coming up saying myocardial ischemia has occurred, as you expect at this point. So we've got 10 atmospheres of pressure there. You can see we've got a little bit of ST elevation there in lead AVF, which is one of the inferior leads, which fit goes along with the, um, the fact that we've um, got a balloon including the artery. I've just deflated our balloon there. You can see on the screen now it's come down. At this point, I usually take a length shot. To, I've got a good idea from what I've just seen, but I'm going to take a, a cine here to document the length of the stenosis that I need to cover. You'll see from that that we've actually opened up the artery quite effectively with our balloon-only angioplasty. We don't seem to create any dissections. 
We um, haven't got any problems with loss of flow, so it's all looking like it's going to plan. The length of the balloon that we use looks like it's sufficient to cover the stenosed area, so I want to make my, sure that my stent that I choose is at least uh, that long, and, and I'm also going to add a couple more millimetres either side of that just to make sure that I've um, covered all of the balloon injured area. So, removing a balloon. Again, you want to make sure that your uh, wire stays still as you do this. So I'm going to screen as we do it. So as I pull back here, I've got my wire fixed. I'm slowly pulling it back. And two things can happen as you pull a balloon back, and particularly if it's not inflated. Firstly, it can pull the guide catheter deeply into the artery, which risks trauma. Secondly, it can cause your guide wire to move forward. Um, so just be aware of those and make sure that you allow sufficient time to, for your balloon to be fully deflated. So on my screen here, the balloon is now greyed out. And for speed, I won't take this off and put it back on again. I'll just tell the computer that this is now going to be a stent. So let's choose our stent. Uh, so we need to go to inventory. Get device. Balloon expandable stent. I'm going to choose a drug looting stent here. Now, the other thing to look at was how big this artery is and how big it looked compared to our balloon. And when I was doing that, I thought the 2.5 balloon looked pretty conservatively sized. I think this artery is at least a 3.5, if not a 4.0. So um, I'm going to choose a 4.0 balloon here. And as I said, we need to choose a length that will be sufficient to cover the artery. Uh, all the balloon injured area of the artery. So we've got a 4018, uh, sorry, 4016 or 20. So I think the 16 should be sufficient. Let's select that. So same procedure again as we uh, stop screening until it's lit up on the screen. We can see our Stent coming down our guide wire, just emerging from the catheter now. Stents obviously can be a bit more difficult to deliver simply because they are stiffer, so they don't like going around bends uh, as easily as balloons. But this one, with the adequate predilatation, has been very simple to deliver. So on that shot, what I'm looking to see is whether I've covered the entire margins of the stenosis. I'm just going to come back a fraction of a millimeter just to take it off that little side branch. Just check again for positioning. That looks great. Now we're just going to inflate this stent, Oops. Inflate this stent here. Up it comes. You can see we've got the myocardial ischemia. I've gone up to 12 atmospheres there. I usually just take a cine to store that, and I store that fluoroscopy. Generally, we leave stents inflated for about 30 seconds to get good balloon expansion. I'll take it down now. On to negative. Wait for the balloon to, delate, uh, to deflate fully. And then once it's done that, we can just smoothly withdraw the balloon back into the catheter. Now, a helpful thing to do at this point is just to take a little puff of contrast. If the worst comes to worst and you've perforated the artery, the balloon's right there. You can plug up that hole straight away uh, while you work out what to do next. So let's just take a quick test. Looks fine. We can take a detailed shot of that in a moment. So. Let's take our balloon out. And again, I'll show you, just for the sake of it, of taking a balloon off a wire. See, so what you want to do is to fix the wire to the table, pull back, fix to the table, pull back. I'm seeing this, my guide catheter moving back as I was doing that, so I'm hoping this is not going to pull everything out. Again, fix, pull back. Just open up our catch as comes through the last part. Uh, 
and that's our balloon out. Close our catch, fix our wire, and take our balloon off. Now there was a little bit of movement on the guide caster as I was doing that because there wasn't the usual, uh, there's not a fluid filled system, so you can see my guide catheter has come back. But my wire position is stable, so what I can do is just advance my guide catheter back over the wire and back into the coronary artery again. So, let's take a cine of our um, stented artery. And what we're looking for on our cine is to see whether the proximal end and the distal end of the artery uh, look okay, whether there's any dissection at either end, which might be evidenced by some haziness. We're looking to see whether the stent itself looks uniformly expanded throughout its length and that the lesion itself is entirely covered. We're going to do some safety checks as well. I kind of got a visual idea in my mind exactly where my wire has been all the way through this case, but I will check any distal branches in case my wire may have inadvertently migrated to those to make sure there's not any wire-induced perforations. And once I'm happy with all those aspects, then we can finish the case. Normally, I would go back and postulate uh, a stent, but for the sake of time, it would just be the same sort of thing over again, but this time ensuring that your uh, post dilation balloon is a non-compliant balloon, and then it's just slightly shorter than the stent that you've done, so you've not got extra um, balloon injury on your artery. And we can have a final look at our radiation doses here. We can see in the center of the patient We've been working in one single view uh, during this case, and for a short case like that, like this, that's perfectly fine. But if you're doing a complicated case, rotablation, chronic total occlusions, for example, moving your C arm position during the case reduces the amount of ex exposure that any one part of the skin is exposed to, and that reduces the skin dose that that patient receives and their risk of getting any radiation-induced damage. So that's something to think about for longer cases. But for a single case like this, we've been, uh, it's been okay just to do it in a single view. But always try and choose those views which not only are good for you, for seeing where you need uh, to place your stent and things, but also what's best for the patient in terms of minimizing the radiation exposure. Great, so thank you very much for watching.